Hey everybody, happy Tuesday. Tyler Grant here at jamplay.com. We're having our big Independence Day celebration, giving away some guitars, giving away some licks, and giving away some insight in order to help improve your guitar playing. That's why we're all here. Welcome. Those of you who are lurking and just checking out the site, remember you can sign up for a membership and you'll get all the benefits that that entails, including uh, the details of a bunch of the points that I'm going to be making in this lesson. Uh, however, these are tips that anybody can enjoy, so uh, grab your guitar and open up your ears and let's do some playing. So, um, my job today is to convey three tips that will improve your bluegrass playing fast. Now, there's lots of different ways to look at that. Uh, bluegrass music tends to be uh, an up-tempo style of music, so we're going to address that, uh, the concept of speeding up your playing. Um, but these are tips that you can just take and start using them right away, and that's the idea. So, tip number one is to use a metronome to improve your timing, your musicality, and to track your progress as far as this tempo thing goes. So, I'm going to show you uh, the metronome that I use is just an app on the phone. Um, I used to use a little, uh, a little handheld metronome that you'd buy from a guitar store. Um, any old metronome will do, and the main thing is that it makes a consistent click. I'll get this as loud as it'll go. So, I don't care if it makes eighth notes, or if it accents a beat. Like this is 4-4, four, four. one, two, three, it's accenting the first beat. I like a metronome, so I set this, it has options, so I set it to 1-4, meaning it's just one beat. I like a metronome to just have one solid click, because, well, you'll see why coming up. Um, but that's all you really need, is a good metronome that has a solid click, uh, doesn't speed up or slow down, that would be the definition of a working metronome, and has a nice sound. Like this has a nice woodblock sound, I've programmed it to. Uh, usually these apps on the phones have uh, choices like that, so, you know, if you like a loud electronic beep, then that's all good, go for that. I like a nice woodblock. That's what this sound is. Hey, okay. Tyler. Could you tell everyone what that app is that you're using? This is called uh, Frozen Ape Tempo, Ape, A-P-E, Frozen Ape, like a gorilla. Um, and I am still using an iPhone 4, so I don't know what the apps are these days. This is pretty archaic. Um, but I believe Frozen Ape is still out there, and it is a good, solid metronome. It cost me two bucks. Um, so once you have these smartphones, it makes your music life a lot easier, as, as many of you know. The other great thing about the smartphone is its voice memo app. Uh, most smartphones, whether you have an iPhone, a Blackberry, or anything else, have a voice memo app. And even if you have an old flip phone, you can leave yourself a voicemail message if you need to remember something. So that's a key tool for learning music these days, especially bluegrass music, which is an aural tradition. We don't write everything down in bluegrass music. It's if you were going to become a real blues player, for instance, you can learn a lot off the tablature, you can learn a lot from taking lessons, but you have to immerse yourself in the style. You have to actually go to some events where people are playing blues and either play along or participate by listening. And that's how we really learn the music. Um, so we'll talk about the voice memo thing in a minute. But anyway, you know, uh, if you're still in the, in, in the old school and you're not using a smartphone, totally fine. You can buy all of these things separately. You can buy a metronome, you can buy a little digital recorder, or even if you have an old tape deck lying around. Those are great tools for jotting down things orally so you can remember them. Uh, anyway, so this is the metronome, and I've got it on a click here. and. Every day I play with the metronome. When I'm practicing, when I'm warming up, the metronome keeps you honest. It keeps you uh, from speeding up, keeps you from slowing down, and it's just a really nice way to track your progress uh, as you're working up to performance tempo in the bluegrass style. 
So let me just give a quick demonstration of some things I might do with the metronome. And you can go ahead and do this with me. Why don't we do this together? I'm going to set it a little bit slower. Now metronomes work really, really well when you're practicing by yourself. Uh, and if you're with a group, you would need to amplify it somehow because as soon as lots of people start playing, you kind of lose, you know, you can't hear it that well anymore. But I'm going to be right here with the metronome and we're going to play these exercises together. And the first one is, uh, this is something... Plug in there. Oh sure, okay, we have a way to plug this in, so let's do that. Thank you. Okay, is this the speaker that it's coming out of? Yeah. Should I, uh... Let's get one. No, nothing. Bear with us, we're trying to get this to come out of the speaker. going. I'm not sure if this is plugged into that. I see the other end going over there. Tick, tick. I'll sing the metronome sound as it's going. Tick, 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 tick. Okay. Well, we'll just go with real sound. I'll balance it on my head so that you can hear it through that microphone. Now, this is especially good exercise because <laughs> you don't want to move too much when you're playing guitar. Okay. So we're going to play the open strings. Now, uh, oftentimes, you know, we talk about this as left hand technique and right hand technique. However, I'm sure there's some lefties out there. So let's just call it picking hand and fretting hand. Can you hear that? Okay, so take your picking hand and align your pick in the proper way, however is the best way that you would hold it. Now this is another thing that you gotta kinda figure out on your own. A teacher's gonna tell you a certain way, but everyone's built differently. So my main thing is to keep, <laughs> it's not gonna work. <laughs> Here we go. I'm gonna be right with the metronome, so don't you worry, just follow me, okay? But at home, you got your metronome, it's clicking, okay? So when I'm holding the pick, I want to make sure it's not going to budge from my fingers. It's as if I have suction cups on either end of it, holding it there. So you can grip the pick really hard, you can grip the pick really soft. I would suggest gripping it like nicely, not hard, not too soft that it's going to fall out of your fingers, but just enough that it stays right there. You want to use as little effort as possible. Okay, now that alone is worth the price of this lesson, okay? Use as little effort as possible when you're playing. And that all lines up to things you're doing, how your mechanics are working, and that's what we're going to do here with the pick on the open strings. So, those of you who have been through my course, you've done this before. However, if you haven't done it, uh, welcome. This is a new thing that will revolutionize your playing. And if you have done this, I'll remind you that you can always get something new out of this because we're looking at one little thing, but we're looking at it so close that we're going to gain insight from it. So, we're going to play quarter notes on each open string. So we're going to do four down strokes on the high E, and then four down strokes on the B string, and then four on the G string consecutively. So here we go. Line up your guitar, sit in the way you would normally be sitting. Now, I don't want to see this kind of thing, like leaning on your leg or the guitar all slouched down. You need the guitar to be up, at least perpendicular, if not angled upward a little bit as you see this is because that makes it easy for your left hand so anything you're doing with the picking hand you want to do this in the same position as if you're fretting as well okay but we're just isolating our picking technique here and doing what we call uh, a calibration exercise so here we go open E four down strokes one two here we go one two three four B string one G, one, two, three, four, D, one, two, three, four, open A, low E, now we're going to go back to the A string, 
now we're gonna skip around at random. Any random string. So now you're working on your aim. Trying to hit the G string, you hit it. Try to hit the high E, you hit it. Try to hit the B, try to hit the high E, try to hit the low E, etc. Random. Just a couple more. Okay. So that's the first step, and that should be feeling pretty good. As you're doing this, you're breathing, you're checking out your picking technique, you're improving your tone, and remember we're doing rest strokes. So if you play like the G string, for instance, you're resting on the next string. And the way I like to think of this is it's just the weight of your hand falling right through that string. And that gets you your loudest, fullest, richest tone out of the instrument, is that rest stroke, versus a free stroke where you're going away. I'm exaggerating here. You don't want to ever do that. That's like, unless you're like really rocking out and doing some move. But these are rest strokes. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, and now we're going to double time that, and it's going to be still all downs. So, but we're going to be playing eighth notes, all down strokes. So it'll sound like one and two and, sorry, I'm with the click. One and two and three and four and, okay? We'll do that on each string. So eight down strokes on every string. Here's the high E. One, two, ready and go. One. Start skipping around at random. Now you'll miss a string every now and then, that's okay. You're working on your aim, you're working on your consistency. And getting to the point where anytime you want to play that B string, boom, there it is. Anytime you want to play the low E, <laughs> there it is. Anytime you want to play the D, there it is. So, you just want to get better and better at your pick control, because uh, that's what this bluegrass style is all about, is the flat picking. Okay? So the last step of this exercise is to double this up again, uh, and now we're subdividing the beat into sixteenth notes. So it's one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a... Now this is where the real magic happens with flat picking style. You want to get your down up down ups uh, really happening, really consistent, uh, and nice tone and musicals. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing, except now we're not doing rest strokes anymore. We've already done that, so since we've been doing that for a while, we're used to that nice full tone, and when we shorten it up for down ups, you want them as short and economical as possible, uh, but you're used to that big full tone of the rest stroke, so that's just going to naturally happen. So here we go, 16th notes, it'll be down, up, 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 on each string. So still four beats, but now it's going to be a 16 total strokes. Here we go. One, two, ready, and a go, and one, two, three, and a four, and B, two, three, four, G, down, up, down. start skipping around. If you do any cross-picking patterns, this is a good time to exercise those. Okay, so there you go. That is the ways to improve uh, your picking technique by isolating your picking technique and working with your metronome. So that's one thing I do with the metronome. Um, I also have all kinds of exercises for the fretting hand, and again, reference the lesson, uh, the lesson series for that on jam play. But it's just the same kind of things, just playing notes, basically. Playing notes in open position and exercising all those fingers in position. First finger, second finger, third finger, fourth.
So basically working out of a chromatic scale and just calibrating that fretting mechanism there. So same kind of principle. Uh, just isolating what's happening with that hand. Because then when you put all these components together, that's how you execute uh, music, technically. Um, you learn the tunes, and then you can play them so much better if you've worked on all the components of your technique and worked on getting a good sound and good timing. The metronome is going to keep you with solid timing. Uh, by the way, we've been at 60 beats per minute this whole time. Three, four, one, two, three. Four. So 60 beats per minute, same, same time as a second, right? Um, okay, so then working with the metronome, here's how I apply that to things musically. So I'll have the metronome happen in here. You know, I bet if I took it out of its case, it would be louder. Maybe. Okay. Okay, so there's the click. It's at now, let's see, 90 beats per minute. And that's where I might do a tune like uh, Arkansas Traveler. Okay, this is an old, old time tune. And it sounds like this. this but the metronome is one and two and three and four and the metronome is happening on the backbeat that's how I like to use it when I'm playing bluegrass tunes fiddle tunes songs because this is where the mandolin would be chopping the bass goes bom 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 and the mandolin goes boom chuck boom chuck boom chuck boom chuck so I like to have the click on the chucks one two three four one two three four Chuck, boom, chuck, boom, chuck, boom, chuck. Okay, so that takes a bit of an adjustment if you're not used to that. Uh, however, it is really going to help your sense of timing uh, with the shuffle, bouncy feel of the bluegrass style. And it's as if there's someone there chopping the mandolin with you. So that makes it really fun. And it makes you accountable for the downbeat, which improves your timing and improves your confidence in your timing. So that's a tune that I might have at about 70, or where are we at, 90 beats per minute. Uh, and then I'll start cranking it up through other tunes. Um, now this brings me to my second tip for improving your bluegrass playing. Uh, learn the tunes. There's no way around it. you got to learn the tunes. So that was Arkansas Traveler. How many of you know Arkansas Traveler? Okay. If you don't know it, uh, you should learn it. Um, there is probably a lesson on jam play. I didn't do this song in my series, but I believe that Orville uh, Johnson did it in his series. Uh, so check out the lesson series and do a search for the tune Arkansas Traveler on jam play. Uh, now, there's also lots of resources out there for learning tunes. Um, and we might as well throw out all these three points. The third point, because these all kind of intermingle, the third tip I'm going to give you today is to get out uh, to some bluegrass jam sessions. Uh, this, this style is a communal style of music. Uh, you're very limited as to what you can do on your own. And you're also quite limited as to what you can learn on your own. Uh, this jam play is an amazing resource. And you can learn all the notes. You can learn all the styles. Uh, you just have to apply it to actually know it. So I would encourage you to get out to some jam sessions. And uh, it's interesting, these days I go around to music camps. I, I, I teach at music camps all around the country. Uh, and a couple weeks ago I was at Kaufman Camp in Tennessee. And nowadays, almost everywhere I go, someone says, oh, hey, you're the guy from Jam Play. I, I love your lessons, you know. Cool, well, that's part of the community. So you're already part of this community here. Uh, 
through jam play and it's important to find your local bluegrass community and even if you just meet a couple bluegrass pickers that'll connect you to the greater scene and in almost every town there are bluegrass jams that happen either weekly or monthly. Uh, I grew up in San Diego County and there was a bluegrass jam that happened every second Tuesday of the month uh, at, at the Fuddruckers restaurant down in La Mesa. So we would go down there on Tuesdays, uh, the second Tuesday of the month, and then the third Tuesday of the month it would be at another location. Uh, but I would always go to that second Tuesday jam and I'd go there and that is what made me the player I am. Uh, being among that community and learning, oh, these are the songs they play, these are the tunes they play, oh, this is how they play them, oh, this is how the thing works when you're playing with other musicians. These are the etiquette, the rules to jamming, uh, to making this music happen. And to this day, I can remember that sound uh, of those fiddles and the banjos ringing out as we drove up to this restaurant and, and thinking how cool that was and how great it was to be a part of that community. So say you're at the Bluegrass Jam and you hear some tune you really like, you know, the fiddle players play in Arkansas Traveler, say, you know, hey, you know, after the jam, say, hey, if you don't mind, come over here and let me take my phone and record you, just play that tune once through so I can learn the melody. So this is how we learn tunes. This is how I learned a lot of tunes. Um, most people are really, really helpful and they want you to learn and they want you to get better. Uh, and there's no real secrets here in this community. So say, hey, I want to learn Arkansas Traveler. Can you record it like real slow for me and have them play it for you? And then you have that on the tape and you can learn it. So I'm in C. This, this tune is usually in D, so we would capo up. This is the other thing you need if you're a bluegrass guitar player is you need a capo. Uh, this is a real fancy capo. It's made by Phil Elliott Capos, and it's it's a handmade, custom kind of thing. They're they're kind of pricey. Uh, that's a really great way to go. Um, but there's also um, more affordable capos that you can get for you know 20 bucks and under. Like a Shub is a good one. Uh, Diderio, Diderio Planet Waves makes a really good capo that's less than 20 bucks. So the capo will move you up to other keys. And for instance, if you're used to playing something out of C position, like I like to play Arkansas Traveler out of C position. Uh, however, it is a D tune. The fiddle players are going to play it in D. The mandolin players are going to play it in D. Um, so you should know all your scales. You should know your keys and be able to play it in different, in different keys. Uh, that's fine. But it's also important to know kind of where the tune lives. And Arkansas Traveler basically lives in D. Um, so I could play that out of D position, but like I said, I enjoy playing it out of C position. So all I do is I capo up to the second fret and play it out of a C position. And now it sounds the same as the key of D. So now I'm technically playing in the key of D, but I'm still thinking of this as a C tune. See what I'm saying? So the capo is very important. And again, going to the bluegrass jams and just watching the guitar players and where they like to capo and what, what chord position they like to play out of. Um, and that makes it so in bluegrass music, all you really need to know is a C chord, uh, a G chord, and a D chord. By that, that's, that's uh, slang for you need to know the key of C, you need to know the key of G, and you need to know the key of D. And with those three keys, you can use the capo to go to any key that you're ever going to use. Uh, so that kind of simplifies this style for us. It lets us focus on a few different chord positions. Because again, in bluegrass music, most everything is played in open position. We get up the neck every now and then, but most of our money is down here. Okay, uh, so I'm going to, in case some of us don't have capos, uh, I'm going to go back to open C. Okay, and now Arkansas Traveler. Okay, you hear somebody play Arkansas Traveler, that tune that I was just playing a minute ago. Uh, and you might hear it like in some kind of fancy arrangement with a bunch of fancy flat picking around it and a bunch of licks involved. Okay, cool. Remember that it's a really, really simple melody. So start by learning the simple melody and getting it in your head. Uh, and I'll teach it to you right now the way I would if I was teaching a class or if you were learning it from somebody at a bluegrass jam. Okay, it goes like this. Ba da 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 that's the A part. 
I'm gonna sing it an octave higher because I can't quite hear those low notes. Da 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 So get out your little voice memo app and record yourself singing that. And then you've got the A part. And all you got to do is figure out where the notes are and pick them out. And uh, and again, if you've followed up with any of my series on jam play, by now you're well acquainted with the key of C major. And you know all the notes in the key of C. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. And you realize that this melody is just based on those notes. Okay, and by now you're probably thinking to yourself, well, I already know this tune. We grew up singing this tune, right? A lot of these are tunes that you know from childhood or you might have heard before. Um, this is folk music, uh, if, you know, if you grew up in the United States. Um, and even if you grew up in Europe, if you grew up in Canada, a lot of this is based on uh, old world fiddle tunes um, and old world songs. So a bunch of this stuff came to America from Europe from uh, the British Isles, from Scottish fiddlers, uh, Irish fiddlers, um, and all the immigrants took this music here, and it was kind of fused with, uh, with American blues and jazz music, and that's kind of where bluegrass came from. So, anyhow, that's the tune. Now that it's in your head, uh, if you really want to learn this tune, uh, pull out your, your voice memo, set it up. Are these archived? Okay, so this lesson will be archived anyway, so you can come back if you're a Jam Play member and watch this lesson again, and you can just skip to this part to learn the tune. But anyway, say you want to learn the tune and you want to do it on the cheap, get out your voice memo and just sing it like this, or let me sing it for you. One, two, three, four. <laughs> And here's the chords. G7. Back to C. So that's the A part. Now, if you know your C major scale, and if you know your C chord and your G7 chord, um, that is material that is nursery rhyme simple. So it's all about just getting it in your head and figuring it out, and then you can throw the fancy stuff on it. But this is number two of my three tips, is learning the tunes, learning the simple melodies. You can do this with your instrument, you can do this away from your instrument. It's a lifelong process. So if you're committed to learning the style, you're always singing these tunes in your head. So that's the A part. The B part goes like this. Da 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 so there you go, I just taught you a new tune, Arkansas Traveler. Um, so the purpose of this particular lesson, since we have this whole string of lessons today on jam play, we're not using as much tablature, okay? And this gives me an opportunity to just kind of express how I feel about the tablature, which is a great learning tool. Uh, but eventually you have to get away from it. You have to memorize that and put the music, uh, the, the thing itself, the sheet of paper that has the notes written on it is not the music, that's just the score. So once you learn that, you put the score away and you internalize the music. So in, in the bluegrass tradition, uh, it's the same as the folk music tradition or the blues music tradition in that there isn't much written down, like I said. So you have to hear it uh, and remember it. So use these tools on jam play to learn your scales, to learn the notes, to actually specifically learn a bunch of the tunes. And then take that and run with it. And you have to kind of get away on your own and try to play it on your own. And then if you can't quite remember it, go back to the lesson and check it out again. Okay, cool. And then go back until you have it memorized. 
And then you can take your guitar outside, you can take it to the jam sessions, and you can play all this music. So, um, so those are the three tips to improving your bluegrass playing and doing it fast, getting you on the fast track to uh, improvement in this style. So let's keep kind of working some of these points, uh, and we'll get back to the metronome. Uh, and then beyond that, I should say that, okay, so you learn that too in Arkansas Traveler. Uh, and then there's, there's a few other things that are kind of a subplot to learning the tunes. Uh, learning the tunes, learning the songs, that's the most important thing. Um, so finding a good resource, like picking up a CD of fiddle tunes, for instance, um, that are not necessarily somebody's interpretation of them, but just straight up fiddle tunes. Like at Cracker Barrel, sometimes I see these like American Fiddle Tunes CD, and, it, and, and I'll look on the back of it and I'll see all my Nashville buddies, like great players like David Greer or Stuart Duncan playing the tunes, but they're playing real basic versions of them. So that's what you want to start with, learning the basic version of the tune. If you uh, check out a player like David Greer, for instance, who's a genius flat picker, uh, and you learn and you listen to his version of the tune, it's going to have all kinds of fancy interpretation in there. So that's part of the deal is like listening to where you can pick out the melody uh, amidst all of the filigree. Um, and then also finding a good recording of just the basic melody and learning it from there. Um, okay, so take an Arkansas Traveler, you can fill it in with all kinds of fancy stuff, and I can play it this way. So that's just me playing around with the tune and adding all these different flat picking things like strums, cross picking, and licks. So that just brings me to the point that like it's also good as you're learning the tunes and as you're learning the songs to pick up a few licks every now and then. So in the Jam Play membership there's a whole lick library and if you, if you search for bluegrass licks or if you search for some of my material you're going to find a bunch of licks. So as you're learning a tune, also learn a lick that goes nicely with that tune. Uh, so for this one, it might be something like... Like that fits in with that tune. If I'm playing like the B part, for instance... I can squeeze that lick in there somewhere. So learning the vocabulary. Learning the tunes, the songs, and a handful of licks. Um, However, I always place importance on the actual tune itself, because if you just know the licks, then you're not really playing the music. So learning the music, and you're going to learn a bunch of licks that are built into the fiddle tunes as well. Okay, so then I take my metronome, and there it was at 90, and that was Arkansas Traveler. Now I'll crank it up to, say, 100. So here I am at 100 beats per minute, and I'll think about a, a tune or a song. This works for songs you're singing as well. Um... I think about something that fits that tempo. So I have an original, an original tune from one of my albums called Springtime Flat Picking. And that exists at about 100 beats per minute. So I'll play that tune here. One, two, three. Etc. So I'll play that tune and I'll get myself warmed up to that tempo. There it is, 104 be beats per minute, or 100. Between 100 and 104. So that's the tune that lives there, and then I'll, I'll keep cranking it up. So again, this is why it's important to know tunes. So I'll crank it up to say 105, okay? And I'll think of a tune that exists at that tempo. And I might do a tune like, uh, and this is one I did cover in one of the lessons the gal I left behind me. This is a nice C tune, and it sounds like this. 
So here's the tempo, 104. One, two, three, four. And I'll always practice the rhythm, meaning the chords and the, and the rhythm strum. At that same time, I'll go back and forth from lead to rhythm. So here I'm back on the lead. back and forth again from rhythm to lead, rhythm to lead. And I'll try some new licks, I'll try some new variations on the rhythm, and that's how I practice tunes. So that's 10, where are we at? 105. And then you kind of get where we're going here. I'll crank it back up to say 110. And then what's the, what's the tune I might play at 110? Um, I think I did this one in one of the lessons as well, When the Saints Go Marching In. Simple melody, we all know it. And here's how I'll do it in a bluegrass style. One, two, three. Play the rhythm through it. Saints go marching in. Might sing it too. I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Then I'll play a break. back and forth like that. So you get it. There's 110. And then I'll work my way up. As a bluegrass musician, you want to be prepared for faster and faster tempos. Now, don't push yourself too far because you don't want to injure yourself. You know, we're all athletes in training. So take your time uh, and try to push that threshold a little bit further uh, each day that you're practicing. So I usually shoot for something like 150, 160 beats per minute, which is fast. I mean, that's really fast. So here's 160. If we were doing that last tune, it wouldn't quite fit. It would be too fast for it. Da, 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 da. Oh, when the saints go marching in, I want to be in that one, two, three, four. Da, 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 pretty fast, right? Um, so I will slowly work my way up to that through these series of stepping stones that are the tunes I know, that live at these certain tempos. Certain tunes live at certain tempos. So uh, as my target of 150, um, I might do a tune, and this is one that I covered in one of the series as well on jam play, uh, Soldier's Joy. And I'm going to go ahead and cape over this. The other reason we use capos is because sometimes it just makes it a little snappier and the, the tune just fits a little bit better uh, on a certain capo position. So, capo two, it's a D tune anyway, and I'm playing it out of C position. 
So I might do like Soldier's Joy at this tempo. Now this is after I've worked my way up, remember. Like I feel comfortable by now after spending an hour or so working through all the stations of the metronome. So this is where I might culminate that exercise. One, two, one, two, three, four. Not quite warmed up to that tempo as you might notice. But playing the rhythm through it, I'm gonna be that much more warmed up the next time it comes around. So that's kind of what you're working toward. And if I had done the whole thing, I'm kind of abbreviating because we don't have much time, I would have been nicely warmed up to that tempo by then. So that's how you use a metronome to keep yourself accountable, to mark your progress as far as your tempo, and also uh, to fill in these tunes. Now, now you're gonna wanna learn a bunch of tunes, right? You wanna learn a tune that fits at 110 beats per minute. You wanna learn a tune that fits at 112 beats per minute. You wanna learn a tune that fits at 120. And for many of you out there, it might be like 120 might be your goal, and that's totally fine. Like, take this next couple months to try to work yourself up to 120. If you're already there, you know, find some tunes that exist at like 130 and work your way up. Uh, and if you want to uh, apply for, say, a real fast picking bluegrass band like Ricky Skaggs and Kentucky Thunder, well, you better work it up to about 190. So that's just the, kind of the spectrum of what you're working with with the metronome. Uh, however, most of these community jams you might go to are going to be friendly regarding that. You might find uh, some hotshot pickers who want to play fast, and that's okay. Uh, most folks around there... Um, <clears throat> you know, depending on your scene, uh, every single town has jams that cater to beginning and intermediate players and that are friendly uh, to that. So seek out your local jams. Um, and yeah, that's about all I got. Uh, and we're probably getting close to being out of time. Do we have some questions coming in? Or, yeah, uh... we've got quite a few questions. All right. Um, we'll be doing another giveaway here in about nine minutes. More uh, like, like five or six. Oh, five or six minutes. Okay. Um, so here's a common question just in general about flat picking. Um, Michael Moody, so when you say flat picking, just to verify, does that mean you don't angle your pick at all? Um, when I say flat picking, I'm actually referring to the style, the style of music. Uh, we, we mostly use a flat pick, and I am actually trying to play, you're very observant there, because I am trying to play without angling the pick too much. However, there are various angles that you might play, like angling it this way for a little bit of a darker tone. I'm usually trying to play as straight down and up perpendicular as possible, just to suit the technique and to execute uh, the notes cleaner. Uh, but flat picking refers to a style of music. So there's lots of styles that would use a flat pick, and, and that's what it's referring to, is, is the flat pick, just a regular old pick, versus, say, a thumb pick or some other type of picking technique, like finger style. So if you're playing rock and roll music like, uh, like Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin, he's using the flat pick, but he's playing in a rock and roll style. So uh, this refers to a specific genre of music known as flat picking, and it is the genre, uh, the style that we play if we were playing guitar in a bluegrass band. Okay, here's one um, from Paul. I'm not going to say the rest of that name. I have a problem with my upstrokes sound so heavy in comparison to the downstrokes. Any tips for that? Okay. Uh, well, again, working on that exercise we did at the beginning, where you're doing just downstrokes in a rest stroke style, that is going to improve 
the volume and the tone of your downstroke. So just work that for a while. Get a good strong downstroke and then when you start incorpor incorporating the up, just work on that on its own, just on an open string until you get that nice even tone. So that would be my advice, that, that tip we did at the, at the beginning of the lesson, if you just do those exercises on the open strings, uh, you will discover yourself all the ways, if you're listening and paying close attention, you'll discover yourself the ways of, of correcting those imbalances. Okay, we've got one from David. What are some good scales to learn for a bluegrass beginner? The C major scale. That's where you should start. Uh, and from there, you can work on the pentatonic scales. Um, and like I said, as you're learning the music, uh, learn the scales associated with it. So for instance, you know, learning that tune Arkansas Traveler, that's all based on a C major scale. So you learn the C major scale, you work on the C major scale, and at the same time, you're learning tunes that apply to it. And then beyond that, it would, it would just be like the pentatonic and blues scales, because those relate to the licks that you're going to be using over these tunes. But I would get as deep inside the C major scale as possible. And then once you know that, transfer that over to G major. And then, oh, you'll realize G major is the same thing, it's just in a different position. And then go over to D major, and you'll realize, oh, it's the same thing. The sounds are all the same. Uh, you're just learning it in a different key. So spend a lot of time on C major. Okay, we have uh, one more question. maybe one more question here from Kevin Moore. Do you prefer to pick below the sound hole for sound or comfort? To me, this is the, the spot where it, it kind of works both ways for me. It's comfortable because when I am playing a dreadnought sized guitar, which is what this is, uh, the way my elbow rests on it, I just put the crook of my arm right there and it puts me right at that back edge of the sound hole. And to me, that's what I call the middle of the road tone. That exists right here and it's your kind of not too bright. If you go back here, it's going to get brighter. If you get over here, it's going to get darker. This is the middle of the road, so that's kind of where I generally do stuff. And if, if it's getting really loud and really intense at a bluegrass jam, I might get a little closer to the bridge. And if I'm strumming, sometimes I'll get over there for a little bit of a brighter sound. So, um, so that's two reasons. One is, one is the sound, and one is actually uh, the playability and the comfort of it. If I was on a smaller bodied guitar, to get that sound my arm would be up here a little bit. If I was on an electric guitar, you'd see my arm would be up here. But on a dreadnought, for me, the way I'm built, it just fits perfectly right there. So these are all part of your body mechanics and part of holding the guitar and part of what size guitar you like to play um, that you'll want to account for. But ultimately, it's the sound you're hearing that's going to guide you. Um, some people were curious about the capo. We're trying to find the capo questions here. Um, from Sean Johnson, do you find you need to retune with a capo? Okay, yeah, that's a very good question. That's the most common capo question, as a matter of fact, uh, 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 aside from like, oh, what key are you in? Okay, so the key thing, you can figure that out. Um, putting the capo on, uh, ideally, it's best to tune open, tune your guitar open, and say I'm going up to the third fret. Now, capo three is a magical zone. I like to do stuff on capo three. So, uh, again, different capos have different mechanisms, but the main idea is you want the capo to be kind of close to the fret, as close to the fret as possible, uh, without actually being on it. So I try to put it like kind of right up against the fret. Sometimes I'll, I'll push my strings down as I'm tightening up the capo. Um, so I'll have to get kind of close here first. And then as I get to the point where it's almost tight, I'll hold the strings down, and then I'll tighten it. Because uh, the reason that it'll go sharp with the capo is that it is pulling the string a little bit too far this way. So you got stuff caught behind the string. So sometimes, uh, sometimes after I put the capo on, I'll, I'll make sure it's on straight and I will have done that thing where I hold the strings down. And then I'll just push, them, push on them all to make sure they're seated. And then I'm in tune. 
So that's, that's kind of the name of the game, is keeping the strings from getting caught there, because it's the same concept as, uh, as if you've tuned up and the string is just used to being there. It needs to be reseated in its current position. So tune really well without the capo, and then once you put it on, hold the strings down as you're tightening it, you know, hold them so they're tight, uh, and then you might still need to do a little push on each one to make sure it's fully seated. And that way you should be able to go to different capo positions without retuning. If I'm in the studio and I'm doing something that really needs to be in pitch, I will do all these things and then I'll check my tuning again with the metronome. Uh, or, I'm sorry, with the tuner. Uh, I'll check my tuning again to make sure I don't need any small adjustments. Because sometimes you might need to adjust just as you get higher up the neck uh, as far as the intonation of your guitar. Um, but putting the capo on properly will solve a lot of that problem for you.